Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a very warm welcome to this current legal problems lecture. Um, my name is Professor Paul Mitchell. I'm one of the editors of the current legal problems series. Before we begin the lecture, I'd just like to take this opportunity to remind you that there is the opportunity to ask questions. Um, please use the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, we hope to be able to get through those questions, or at least as many of those as we can, at the end of the lecture. My second purpose um, this evening is to introduce our chair. Um, this evening, the chair is Her Honour Judge Carolyn Hilda. We're absolutely delighted to have Her Honour Judge Hilda um, be able to share this uh, lecture. She's uh, been a senior judge of the Court of Protection since 2017, <coughs> in which capacity she has, of course, had to have many dealings with the liberty protection safeguards, which are the subject of this evening's lecture. When she was interviewed in 2018, she intriguingly said, I think the law has as yet some way to evolve in this area. So we hope that she'll be able this evening to see at least some of the ways in which it has evolved since then. Carolyn, thank you very much indeed for chairing the lecture this evening. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you to University College London for inviting me to chair this evening's current legal problems lecture. It gives me very great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Professor Rosie Harding. She will be well known to many of you, but I think a delightful and inspiring new acquaintance for some. When she isn't zooming round the stratosphere, Rosie is based at the Law School of Birmingham University, and she is also chair of the Socio-Legal Studies Association and a charity trustee of Changing Our Lives, which is a rights-based organisation working alongside disabled people and people experiencing mental health difficulties to find solutions to social injustice and health inequality. Rosie's research interests are indeed focused on how law operates in everyday life, how real people experience legal frameworks and how they make decisions about whether or not to use the law, particularly in the context of intimate and caring relationships. So she comfortably strides forth across those silos of equality law, family law, healthcare law, human rights and jurisprudence. So she runs a project called Everyday Decisions and the website details will be available on request, um, which explores how socio-legal understandings of capacity impact on the everyday lives of people, particularly with intellectual disabilities. And in 2017, she published through Cambridge University Press, a monograph entitled Duties to Care, Dementia, Relationality and Law. And that explored how those who care for people with dementia experience the regulatory frameworks surrounding the very challenging work which they do, with particular emphasis on the funding, the resourcing aspect of that. But this evening, Rosie will be focused specifically on issues around deprivation of liberty. From the Bournewood litigation came the deprivation of liberty safeguards. And from that perhaps less than satisfactory experience, we anticipate moving in April next year to the new scheme of the liberty protection safeguards. And this evening, Rosie has taken on the very brave task of evaluating the prospects of that new scheme being positive legal reform. So over to Rosie and thank you in advance. Much for that um, lovely introduction. If I, I'm, I'm far too modest to accept any of the nice things you said. Uh, anyway, um, during the last year or so, we've all had a taste of what it feels like to be deprived of our liberty in order to protect our own health and the health of others. 
And as I speak today in March of 2021, after nearly a year of the restrictions, um, we're looking forward to a gradual loosening of those restrictions on our liberty as infection rates fall and vaccination numbers rise. For many of us, these restrictions will, we hope, eventually fade into distant memories as we readjust to living our lives with the levels of personal freedom that we were all previously used to. But for some citizens, some members of our community, deprivation of liberty is not an exceptional state, only taking place in times of emergencies. For many people with learning disabilities, with dementia or other neurodegenerative conditions, or with acquired brain injury, limitations on the freedoms that the rest of us usually take for granted are a part of their everyday lives. The issue of when and how disabled people can be lawfully deprived of their liberty poses a number of thorny conceptual, practical and legal challenges. It has been a point of tension in mental capacity law, as Her Honour just Judge Hilder said a moment ago, since 2004. And this is because the European Court of Human Rights held that HL, a man with severe autism, who had been informally admitted to a psychiatric hospital, was unlawfully deprived of his liberty in breach of his rights under Article 5 of the European Convention of Human Rights. The problem became known as the Bornwood Gap, which refers to any situation where a person of unsound mind who lacks the capacity to consent, receives care and or treatment in circumstances where they cannot leave, but do not clearly object and are therefore not covered by the legal safeguards in the Mental Health Acts. The first attempt to bridge the Bornwood Gap came through the deprivation of liberty safeguards, the DOLS. The DOLS scheme applied only to um, so the Dole scheme applied only to deprivations of liberty that took place in care homes and hospitals and only in relation to adults over the age of 18. Deprivations of liberty of intellectually disabled people aged 16 or 17 or those which take place outside the formal care institutions need to be authorised by the Court of Protection. And as I will outline in more detail in a moment, the Doles have proved themselves to be somewhat unfit for purpose and the general consensus across all those who are tasked with their use, interpretation and implementation is that a replacement scheme is required. A decade later, a new statutory scheme for bridging the Bournemouth Gap, now to be called the Liberty Protection Safeguards, completed the final stages of its turbulent journey through Parliament. This new scheme in the Mental Capacity Amendment Act 2019 applies to arrangements for care that deprive a person of their liberty under Article 51E, where the person lacks capacity to consent and is not subject to mental health arrangements. The new LPS are somewhat wider than the dolls and will be able to apply to care and treatment in hospitals, care homes or in the community. It's not yet been implemented, despite the fervent pace of the reform, uh, though the government have announced that the new scheme will come into force in April 2022. My aim this evening is to explore the socio-legal conditions that made reform of the dolls necessary and to evaluate the new LPS scheme against the principles underpinning Article 5 of the European Convention on Human Rights and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and Disability Social Justice. Might be a big task, so I might have to speak quite quickly at times to get through all the things I want to say. Um, to do so, I begin with a very brief history of the relevant legal moments in the path that we've taken towards the LPS, as well as some of the controversies surrounding the bill during its journey through Parliament and the changes and compromise achieved during that process. Understandably, given the significant debate about the LPS scheme, there remains some doubt in health and social care practitioner communities about the appropriateness and workability of the scheme. In part two of the lecture, and in response to these concerns, I evaluate whether the statutory scheme, as enacted, has the potential to be good law. To do so, I'm going to draw on Bingham's eight sub-principles of the rule of law. Now, I don't want to argue that Bingham's sub-principles are either necessary or sufficient to evaluate whether any given law is effective. As many of you who know my work will know, um, I much prefer to look at law as it exists out there in the world. Um, rather, I think that Lord Bingham's sub-principles of the rule of law provide a useful starting point for evaluating a legal framework that's not yet in force. An evaluation of the LPS in this way will highlight some problems that I think do persist within the new framework. Um, and I will argue that while they provide a reasonable solution, there are some questions that remain for me, both about the LPS alignment with international human rights norms and whether it will prove to be a stable bridge over the Bornwood Gap. Um, I will then go on to argue that we can think differently about this if we use a different conceptual frame um, to think through what we're doing with law. Um, so I'm going to use the capabilities approach as set out by Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, among others. Um, 
And I think that, that provides us with a set of conceptual tools that might offer a different and perhaps better way of thinking about both the Bournewood Gap um, and the LPS, and therefore offer us alternative solutions founded in social justice. So many of the problems with the dolls have been detailed by others in the past, and I don't have time to provide an in-depth commentary on all of the failings of the dolls regime. Um, but suffice to say, former Vice President of the Court of Protection, Mr Justice Charles, notoriously described working with it as, and I quote, as if you have been in a washing machine and spin dryer, end quote. There are, however, some key moments in the life of dolls that both catalyzed and accelerated the need for change that I think help to explain where we are today. A major catalyst for change to the dolls has been the rising backlog of incomplete dolls applications, uh, which stood at uh, 129,780 on the 31st of March 2020. We must remember always that these statistics, these numbers represent people who may be unlawfully deprived of their liberty without access to procedural safeguards and, and, and in breach, therefore, of their convention rights. Unlawful deprivation of liberty is an actionable human rights infringement and can give rise to claims for damages under the Human Rights Act 1998. The failure of the current system means that very many people are currently deprived of their liberty without proper authorization for much longer periods than they should be, leaving local authorities potentially at risk of being liable for significant sums. The backlog developed as a consequence of that exponential increase that you see on the graph there in applications following the Cheshire West decision in 2014. Cheshire West provided a significant clarification of the definition of deprivation of liberty for the purposes of the dolls. In that case, uh, Lady Hale set out the acid test for deprivation of liberty, which is that the person firstly lacks the capacity to consent to their care and treatment arrangements, second is under continuous supervision and control, and third is not free to leave. The Court of Appeal subsequently clarified that not free to leave means not free to leave in the sense of removing themselves permanently <coughs> in order to live where and with whom they choose. The deprivation of liberty must also be imputable to the state in order to fall under these provisions and Article 5 of the European Convention on Human Rights. A person can still be deprived of their liberty under the acid test if they're able to go out on trips and so on, but they must always return to the place where they're deprived of their liberty. And the Cheshire West decision was not the only reason for the backlog, of course. Um, the inability of local authorities to process the increased numbers of dolls applications following that decision was also a consequence of the bureaucratic nature of the dolls regime as a whole and in combination with falling local authority budgets during the austerity pol politics of successive um, conservative governments between 2010 and 2019. Um, and importantly, statistics on incomplete dolls applications only tell part of the story of the problems with dolls. The backlog of applications reported in the official statistics only applies to those which fall under the dolls regime. As I mentioned before, some um, types of uh, deprivations of liberty need to be um, authorised by the Court of Protection. Um, and this slide shows the numbers of applications and orders around deprivation of liberty in the Court of Protection from the period of 2009 to 2019. Um, deprivations of liberty that take place in supported housing, community placements, shared life placements, people's own homes, or that relate to people who are over the age of 16 but under 18 or fall into the apply to the court of protection category. Um, the best estimate for on, in the most recent impact assessment on the new framework is that there'll be just under 60,000 of these kinds of dolls, uh, LPS applications per year. As we can see from this um, graph, a quite lower number of those uh, currently are taken to the Court of Protection, in part because they're not being prioritised, in part because taking cases to court is seen as a, a last resort, I think, in many cases, uh, and, and even the much more accessible Court of, Pro court of Protection. Um, the the issue of care and treatment that deprives 16 and 17 year olds of their liberty has been the subject of considerable litigation. Um, in RECI, uh, it was held that only the Court of Protection could authorise care and treatment arrangements for, the, for children over the age of 16 and under the age of 18. And um, in, that was clarified by the Supreme Court in 2019. So 
the, it was a Supreme Court decision, Reed D in 2019. The full impact of that, I don't think, has percolated through into court protection applications yet, although um, perhaps I'm wrong on that. I'm not so much on the coal face. Um, but there are potential for wide ramifications of that, especially if the implementation of the liberty protection safeguards is further delayed from the 2022 date that we're now expecting. Um, so, as well as all this that's been going on, there have been significant changes in the international context of disability human rights over the same period. Um, the United Kingdom ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD, in June 2009. And the CRPD approached the issue of the right to liberty and security of the person rather differently from the European Convention on Human Rights. Whereas Article 5.1e of the European Convention on Human Rights makes provision for the lawful deprivation of liberty of persons of unsound mind, Article 14 of the CRPD declares that the existence of a disability shall in no case justify a deprivation of liberty, and that persons with disabilities shall enjoy this right on an equal basis with others. And these bifurcated perspectives on the scope of the right to liberty for mentally, intellectually and psychosocially disabled people present an additional challenge for reform of these safeguards against arbitrary deprivation of liberty for disabled people. The Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities issued guidelines on the right to liberty and security of persons with disabilities as an annex to their report to the 72nd session of the UN General Assembly. And now those guidelines are unequivocal that Article 14 of the CRPD prohibits the deprivation of liberty on the basis of actual or perceived impairment quote, even if additional factors or criteria are used to justify the deprivation of liberty. And according to the committee, this remains the case, even where the additional factors or criteria are, and I quote, perceived danger they allegedly propose to themselves or others. The right to liberty, as interpreted by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, therefore, is much wider than that contained in the ECHR. And the two interpretations are rather difficult to reconcile in domestic law. But whereas Article 5 of the European Convention is directly justiciable in our, in our domestic courts as a consequence of the Human Rights Act, the United Kingdom is also bound by the provisions of the CRPD because we ratified it along with the optional protocol. The optional protocol of the CRPD allows for individual complaints to the committee alongside a general inquiry process. Uh, it was the CRPD inquiry process that was the mechanism under which they found that the UK welfare reforms since 2010 had led to systematic violations of the rights of persons with disabilities in the UK. Um, many other Council of Europe member states have also ratified the CRPD and the European Union has ratified the CRPD. So it is possible, perhaps even likely, that European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence may in time move closer to the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities position on the right to liberty for disabled people, despite the provisions in Article 5 that make it lawful to sometimes deprive people of unsound mind of their liberty. So these factors in combination, I think, led to the dolls being declared not fit for purpose in the 2014 review by the House of Lords. There was then a review by the Law Commission that took place from 2015 to 17, which called for the dolls to be replaced with pressing urgency. Um, the replacement framework called the Liberty Protection Safeguards will apply in a wider range of settings, including in private domestic settings to a wider range of people, including 16 and 17 year olds, and will be able to be authorised by a wider range of responsible bodies, not only lo local authorities, as is the case under the Dolls. The Law Commission also recommended further changes to the Mental Capacity Act 2005 to bring the MCA closer into compliance with the UNCRPD. The proposed framework was adjusted by the 2017 to 2019 minority Conservative government and introduced into Parliament in July 2018. It then had a turbulent and rather speedy passage through Parliament, um, but the Mental Capacity Amendment Act 2019 gained royal assent in May 2019, and as I said, we expect it to be implemented next year in April. Um, when the bill was introduced, it became apparent quite quickly that the adjustments made by the government had stripped the Law Commission's proposals of many of their careful controls. In place of these, the bill proposed a significant greater role for registered care home managers in the LPS um, and the passage of the bill through Parliament did reintroduce some of the elements that had been removed from the Law Commission scheme, um, notably ensuring that any deprivation of liberty was necessary to protect a person from risk or harm and proportionate to that risk or harm. Um, extending 
the LPS to cover 16 and 17 year olds, that was removed, presumably because it was too difficult or something, uh, and introducing conflict of interest checks and balances on the powers that had been devolved to care home managers. Um, in October of last year, the Department for Health and Social Care announced that part, the parts of the Act that introduced a new role for care home managers um, would not now be implemented with the other parts of that Act. It's not clear yet whether the intention is that these will be introduced later once the scheme is up and running or whether they're now completely gone from the framework. Um, they've not either not made a decision or not made an announcement on that. Um, the criticism levelled at the Act has meant that many working in the health and social care sector who will be tasked with using this scheme in practice were deeply sceptical of it when it was completing its journey through Parliament. Um, for example, over 100 social care organisations signed an open letter to the Minister of State for Social Care in February 2019, which called for a pause and a reflection on the new bill. The concerns expressed included the limited amount of consultation that had taken place, problems with the new role for care home managers, which, as I say, has been dropped for now, and the lack of robust impact assessments about what this was all going to cost. Um, there's a danger that the outrage that surrounded the passage of the bill through Parliament might then lead to a general distrust of the framework when it's brought into force. Um, and if the LPS are not fully engaged with by the social care sector, there's a real danger that the problems of the dolls, backlog, delay, many thousands of people being unlawfully deprived of their liberty without access to legal safeguards, will just be remade in the new system. So in the next part, I want to evaluate this new framework um, in its final form and see whether the changes that have, have successfully addressed the concerns expressed by the health and social care sector, disabled people's organisations and legal commentators. So is the Mental Capacity Amendment Act good law? Evaluating whether a statutory scheme is good law is not a straightforward process. Without the benefit of judicial interpretation, we're limited to evaluating whether it meets the various criteria that have been put forward as vital to law in a general sense, alongside nor normative evaluation of the content of the law overall. Legal theorists have pro proposed a wide range of conceptual frameworks for evaluating law, and any one of these might provide a reasonable approach for evaluation. Taking a natural law approach, for example, might lead us to explore the LPS in a way that simultaneously explores the rules along with their moral basis. For example, we might use Fuller's eight desiderata for excellent law, that law must be based on rules which are published, prospective, intelligible, not contradictory, possible to comply with, reasonably stable through time and congruent between the rules and their administration as our starting point. Alternatively, we could take a positivist approach and say, well, it's law, as Hart would uh, have taken. He, Hart would eschew any necessary connection between law and morality, focusing instead on whether the law in question meets the criteria of the fundamental rule of recognition to be constitutionally valid. Um, that the Mental Capacity Act, uh, Amendment Act gained royal assent means that it is certainly law, um, but the statutory code of practice, which will guide the implementation and ultimate practice of the LPS, has a more tenuous position, I would say. But I'm not going to use either of them. I'm going to use uh, the pragmatic approach proposed by Lord Bingham in 2007, his eight sub rules of the rule of law, uh, which result from a long tradition of um, legal theory from Dicey to Fuller, Raz and others. Uh, and later, I'll turn to look at the LPS from the perspective provided by the capability approach to social justice. My aim in using these contrasting frameworks to evaluate and analyze the legal the liberty protection safeguards is threefold. First, I want to evaluate the potential success of the, of the LPS as a statutory scheme to bridge the Bornwood gap. Second, as a mechanism for highlighting the importance of being aware of our conceptual approach in lawmaking, law using and in regulation. And third, to demonstrate the potential gains from thinking differently about disability rights. Despite or perhaps because of the long-standing endeavours of legal theorists, there is no single accepted framework for evaluating the efficacy or appropriateness of any given statutory scheme, as I've said. Bingham's eight sub-rules of law offer us, I think, a useful descriptive account of the kinds of issues with legislation that are engaged with by judges when seeking to evaluate law. As a result, they have a level of practical use in providing a set of interrogative questions to ask of the new LPS scheme. 
And um, before moving out to go into them in any detail, I want to make clear that I'm using them here as a, a heuristic advice, uh, device rather than a normative or a descriptive one. I don't want to suggest that I think it's necessary or sufficient to evaluate law in these terms. I would much rather be doing empirical work with people on the ground, finding out what's happening, but they're not in force yet and they're not happening yet, so I can't, but I will one day, assuming they do appear in actual real life. Um, but what I hope to do is highlight some areas where the effectiveness of the law will depend on how it is used and applied in that everyday life context. Um, and find ways to sort of encourage everyone who uses them to, to think of them in terms of disability social justice rather than procedural expediency. Um, there's little doubt that the LPS as enacted is a much better law than the adjusted LPS scheme that was first introduced in Parliament. The, the amendments that took place during its course were positive for the scheme. I'm not sure it's quite as good as the Law Commission scheme would have been. Um, Lord Bingham's first principle is that the law should be accessible and so far as possible, intelligible, clear and predictable. The LPS are certainly clearer than the dolls. We can hope that there will be no washing machine spin cycles for anyone using the LPS. Um, but importantly, the liberty protection safeguards need to be accessible to a really wide range of people. Capacity lawyers, yes, specialist social workers, approved mental capacity professionals, frontline care and support workers, care home managers, independent advocates, and people with learning disabilities. Um, they'll all have to engage with the LPS on some level or another. It needs to be clear enough to be understood by lay people acting as appropriate persons who are tasked under the scheme with representing and supporting people with learning disabilities who are being cared for in uh, arrangements that deprive them of their liberty. And they need to be accessible enough to all those who are consulted about the arrangements about the proposed deprivation of liberty. Um, crucially, this includes those who find themselves being deprived of their own liberty through that framework. And there are specific provisions in the Mental Capacity Amendment Act that require a range of public bodies to publish information about the LPS, including process, effects and what the different roles and types mean. Um, and there's also a duty to provide that information in ways that are accessible to the cared for persons. And I think that's a really good thing. And I think it's fantastic that that, that amendment was on the face of the statute uh, through the course of challenges in Parliament. Um, importantly, though, much of the clarity, intelligibility and accessibility of the LPS as a framework is going to depend very heavily on the code of practice. The code of practice is due to be published for consultation sometime in spring 2021. So any time now, we hope. Uh, the new code will also be integrated into the Mental Capacity Act 2005 Code of Practice, which is also being updated at the same time. Um, so the code that's going to be consulted on is, is a combined code, which I think is a really good thing because it previously the, the, the Dolls Code was separate from the Mental Capacity Act Code of Practice. So it didn't have the sort of supported decision making and presumptions of capacity, important principles that are there in the Mental Capacity Act quite so well integrated into it. Um, I mean, I hope it'll be well integrated. I haven't seen it, obviously, um, but hopefully it'll be published soon. Um, one place where particular vigilance is going to be required when we get the chance to consult on the code of practice is the definition of deprivation of liberty, which is going to be included in the code because it was not, in the end, included in the statute. The definition of deprivation of liberty was particularly contentious through the passage of the Mental Capacity Amendment Act. Um, in their report that formed the basis and gave the draft bill for the scheme, uh, the Law Commission had recommended that the LPS shouldn't have a statutory definition because the meaning of deprivation of liberty is shaped by the interpretation of the Strasbourg Court. In contrast, the Joint Committee on Human Rights argued that a statutory de definition would bring clarity for families and for frontline professionals. Um, paradoxically, the short-lived definition that did find its way into the bill um, in Parliament uh, was far from clear. Instead, it was littered with double negatives and sought to narrow the definition of deprivation of liberty away from that set out in the Supreme Court's acid test. Um, had that definition made it to the statute book, I think it would have done very little to decrease the numbers of disabled people deprived of their liberty without access to safeguards. And I think it would have led to a new round of costly litigation. This litigation would in turn have had to interpret the definition in line with the Strasbourg jurisprudence. So 
but it would likely have just ended up back where we are now with a different definition from case law than we have on the face of the statute. So look out for that and when you get the chance respond to it I think is what I'm saying. Um, anyway we don't yet know whether the LPS will be as accessible, intelligible and clear and predictable as it could be because the code of practice and the accompanying regulations of which there will be many have not yet been published. We can hope that it will be given the layers of dialogue and consultation that have been woven into the process uh, and that there was a co-production group that significantly contributed to the drafting of the code. Um, so hopefully, will it be accessible? Hopefully. Um, Lord Bingham's second sub rule of law is that questions of legal right and liability should ordinarily be resolved by application of the law and not the exercise of discretion. Um, and this is because overuse of discretion can lead to arbitrary and unpredictable outcomes. Happily, there are clear rules in the LPS framework that set out when it is lawful to, to deprive a person of their liberty through them and when it is not. Um, and the clear rules are the authorization conditions and they're the primary legal safeguard in the LPS. They are that the person lacks capacity to consent to the arrangements, that the cared for person has a mental disorder and that the arrangements are necessary to prevent harm to the cared for person and proportionate in relation to the likelihood and seriousness of harm to the cared for person. No deprivation of liberty can be authorised or renewed under the LPS scheme that does not fulfil these authorisation conditions. And we must guard against falling back on shorthand and discretion in practice rather than using these rules. We must always remember that it is only lawful under the LPS to deprive a disabled person of their liberty when it is both necessary and proportionate to do so in those terms. But I think that will work quite well. Lord Bingham's third sub rule is that of equality before the law. And this is one that I think actually it's always going to be difficult for the liberty protection safeguards to fulfil. Article 5 of the ECHR, which is the guiding framework for the LPS, as I've said, sits uneasily beside similar principles in the CRPD. Um, whereas Article 5 provides for the deprivation of liberty of persons with unsound mind, as I mentioned earlier, Article 14 of the CRPD is resolute that the existence of a disability shall in no case justify a deprivation of liberty. My personal view is that in time the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights will move more in that direction through the living instrument doctrine and a decreasing margin of appreciation for depriving people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities of their liberty. A shift in that direction will undoubtedly help to ensure greater equality before the law for disabled people and move away from the position we have in the LPS, where a framework for liberty deprivation applies only to one minority group, and even then only to a small proportion of that minority group. So it doesn't really fit with what we understand equality to be about. And for now, the way through this apparent tension is, I think, to focus on the safeguarding nature of the LPS. Notwithstanding their procedural focus, the LPS are safeguards against the arbitrary detention of disabled people. The reason they will exist is not only to provide a legal or procedural solution to the Bournewood gap, it is that, but it's also to ensure that restrictions on the freedoms of disabled people are only imposed where they are absolutely necessary. Um, and if we keep this, the, the safeguarding practice in mind rather than the deprivation bit of it in mind, that should be better. Uh, the fourth um, of Lord Bingham's principles is that people using them act in good faith. I'm sure that all of the best interest assessors, AMCPs, um, social workers, frontline care professionals who are using these will do so in good faith. Um, and we depend on um, those of you applying them and using them to be able to do that. Um, and if they do not, I hope and expect that any ultra-virus decisions will be challenged through the courts um, by our very able group of Court of Protection Specialist Barristers, and some of whom are listening, I believe. Uh, Bingham's fifth sub-rule of law is that the law should protect fundamental rights. And again, the LPS are designed to do this. Their purpose is to provide procedural safeguards to protect disabled people from being deprived of their liberty. But there is some work to be done by those implementing the LPS on this score. I'm still concerned about the review and renewals processes in the LPS. Um, LPS authorizations can be renewed for up to three years at a time after an initial renewal period of 12 months. And there are no time limits for regular reviews specified on the face of the act. The ability to renew these authorizations is one of the ways in which the new safeguards will be less costly and less bureaucratic than the current scheme. 
but it will be extremely important in upholding and protecting the fundamental rights of a person who is deprived of their liberty under the LPS, that in each and every review and renewal process, those responsible for it give due consideration to whether or not the authorisation conditions are still met, and that that three-year renewal should really only be used in exceptional circumstances, in my view. It's a long time to go without review. Um, if it isn't used in that way, then the LPS, I think, may not be doing its job and it may not be safeguarding disabled people's human rights. Um, the sixth and seventh um, sub rules of law are that a method should be provided at a reasonable cost to resolve civil disputes and that adjudicative procedures provided by the state should be fair. I think there is no doubt about that. The Court of Protection are brilliant. Um, I have to say that, obviously, given who the chair is of my lecture, but I do think that that's true. And also there's um, there's going to be non-means tested legal aid to enable people to challenge their liberty protection safeguards authorization. So I think this is good. There is a, a small possible issue where a person, is, whether non-means tested legal aid will be available to a person who is deprived of their liberty without a liberty protection, liberty protection safeguard authorization. But I'm sure we'll get to the bottom of that one. Um, the, I've lost my place a little. I digressed and I'm not sure what I'm talking about. Um, so, ah, yes, finally, Lord Bingham's final um, sub rule is that the um, rule of law requires the state to comply with its obligations in international law. Now, I talked about this earlier. I don't want to go into a load of detail about it, but there is a tension between the ECHR and the CRPD. Um, and the existence of a disability as being a sufficient justification for, for depriving a person of their liberty is a difficult one in the CRPD context. Um, the CRPD has, however, made significant gains for disability rights, and I would not be at all surprised if this normative tension between the ECHR and the CRPD um, becomes more relevant to us all uh, in the coming years. In summary then, evaluating the liberty protection safeguards against Lord Bingham's sub-principles for the rule of law seems to suggest that it has the potential, at least, to be a good law. So, in summary, evaluating the LPS against Lord Bingham's sub-principles for the rule of law suggests that it has the potential to be good law, at least. By the time they come into force, the LPS will, with the assistance of the Code of Practice, be accessible, clear and intelligible. The Code of Practice itself should also enable people who are deprived of their liberty under the LPS to be confident that the interference with their rights is necessary, proportionate and in accordance with law. They'll be backed up by an accessible and fair adjudicative process through the Court of Protection and supported by non-means tested legal aid. It's not altogether surprising that this legal framework, devised as it was by the eminent legal minds at the Law Commission, will provide a procedurally appropriate mechanism for authorising deprivation of liberty under Article 5. There are, however, two issues that continue to trouble me about the LPS. Neither are problems that a procedural approach to human rights can resolve. First, Article 5.1e of the ECHR permits the deprivation of per liberty of persons of unsound mind. This is not, in my view, sufficient justification for the view that we should deprive people with autism or learning disability of their liberty. We need to have a broader conversation about that, including with disabled people. The LPS and the dolls which preceded them do not enable us to question whether it is right that the Bornwood Gap exists at all. They are a procedural bridge to allow persons of unsound mind to be deprived of their liberty to protect them from harm. They're a lawyer's solution to a lawyer's problem. They take little, perhaps, consideration of the realities of disabled people's lives. The tensions between the ECHR and the CRPD about disability rights particularly conflicting understandings of the right to liberty and security of the person and the right to live independently in the community need to be interrogated and resolved. We need to collectively think about why and whether Article 5.1e should apply in contexts beyond that which have been discussed and authorised by the European Court of Human Rights. And I'll come back to that again in a moment. Um, and I think this is not actually helped by the elevated legal status of the European Convention as compared to other international conventions that the United Kingdom have ratified. Um, finally, I think one of the key drivers for changes to the legal framework for authorising deprivation of liberty was the finding in Cheshire West that Article 5 rights to procedural safeguards against deprivation of liberty also apply in community settings. In other words, it's possible for a disabled person to be deprived of their liberty when living 
in their own home in the community or their family home if they have a care plan that restricts their freedoms in ways that a person without a disability would not be subjected to. And in many respects, this is conceptually challenging, particularly for carers and family carers. Many family carers find it very difficult to recognise the support and care that they provide to a disabled family member to live as well as they can with anything even remotely connected to a legal concept of deprivation of liberty. And a recent example of this is the re-AEL case, which um, Her Honour Justice Hilder decided quite recently. I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, where disagreements over whether or not a care plan and living arrangements amounted to a deprivation of liberty led to protracted proceedings over a period of more than three years. And there remains considerable resistance to the idea of deprivation of liberty in the community. And it is, I think, an issue that we need to explore more openly because the case needs to be made for why the LPS are a positive framework rather than a mere administrative and bureaucratic burden. Now, evaluating the procedural legal approach to the LPS, which I've just done, can't help us to address these more complicated questions. Instead, I want to argue that if we take a different lens, the lens provided by the capabilities approach to justice, we can get a, a set of different conceptual tools that will enable some of these remaining tensions in the LPS to be resolved. Um, the capabilities approach to justice, as its starting point, what do people need in order to be and do the things that they value? Um, it was developed by Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum. Um, Amartya Sen understands capabilities as practical opportunities, the actual material opportunities that people have to do the things they value. And according to Sen, our focus should be on the freedom that a person actually has to do this or be that things that he or she may value doing or being. And one reason for focusing on these practical opportunities, rather than on, for example, the equal distribution of resources, is that the capabilities approach allows the additional support that disabled people may require to have the practical opportunity to do the things they value, to be included in deliberations about how support should be distributed. Sen makes no claims that his capability approach provides any specific formula for how policy decisions about resources should be made, merely that inequality of capabilities is relevant in the assessment of social disparities. Um, Nussbaum's approach to capabilities is somewhat different from Sen's. Her approach focuses more clearly on social policy issues, and one area where Nussbaum takes a clear departure from Sen's approach is that she identifies a list of 10 central capabilities, which I've listed there on the slide. Um, and several of Nussbaum's central capabilities are implicated in the law and policy of deprivation of liberty safeguards. Most obviously, the threshold capabilities of life, bodily health and bodily integrity are brought into play by the third authorisation condition of the LPS, that the arrangements are necessary to prevent harm to the person and proportionate in relation to the likelihood and seriousness of that harm. The LPS also encourages a number of Nussbaum's, uh, sorry, engages a number of Nussbaum's other central capabilities, including the need to have control over one's environment and support for practical reason, by which she means engaging in critical reflection about the planning of one's own life. Affiliation, being able to live with and towards others is also important here, as is play, being able to laugh, play and enjoy recreational activities. Nussbaum argued that a decent political order must secure to all citizens at least a threshold level of these 10 central capabilities. And alongside the identification of these central capabilities, the approach developed by Sen and Nussbaum also places significant value on the importance of public debate in identifying and giving shape to the capabilities that apply in any given situation. It's important, therefore, that there is informed, nuanced public discourse on the appropriate regulatory response to care and support that gives rise to restrictions on and deprivations of the liberty of liberty for disabled people. And in the remainder of this part, um, I want to, under and I'm, I'm nearly finished, I promise, I've been talking for ages. Um, I want to undertake a capabilities informed analysis of the two issues with the LPS that I identified earlier. Um, that can't, I think, be resolved through a doctrinal analysis of what the statute says. Um, first, instead of whether instead of bridging the Bournemouth gap, we should remove it entirely, fill it in, fill it in with other stuff, fill it in with support for people, and whether and why we need to understand support to enable disabled people to live in the community as a deprivation of their liberty. So, should we deprive disabled people of their liberty for their own safety? As mentioned before, there's a normative disagreement between the ECHR and the CRPD about whether or not disability should be a reason to deprive a person of their liberty. 
My concern is that this issue has not quite been given the level of public attention that it deserves. Occasionally, abusive disabled people in care institutions are exposed and in the public domain, like the panorama programmes on Winterbourne, Winterbourne View in 2011 or the Wharton Hill Psychiatric Hospital in 2019. And following these high profile exposés, there's public outcry and some individual prosecutions, but it seems that little changes in the wider regulatory milieu surrounding residential and inpatient care for people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. Social media campaigns by family carers of people with learning disabilities or autism who've been um, detained because of their disability have also helped to bring this issue to public attention, though again these have often not seemed to catalyse wider regulatory reform. And despite efforts from the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to highlight the importance of challenging the deprivation of liberty of disabled people as part of the right to enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with others, and an end to the non-consensual treatment and deprivation of people with mental health problems, for example, as well as um, learning disabilities or autism on a global scale seems really quite unlikely at the present time. Um, the 2021 White Paper on reforming the Mental Health Act does seek to move learning disability and autism out of the category of mental disorders warranting compulsory treatment under Section 3 of the Mental Health Act, though admission for mental health assessment would still be possible under Section 2. Um, and this appears at first look to be a positive development. It will be vital, though, to be attentive to the possibility that instead of the regular reviews and the, the, the tribunal system that's available to people who are sectioned under the Mental Health Act, um, whether this would mean that people with learning disabilities and autism who are admitted for inpatient treatment in mental health settings will instead have their treatment and deprivation of their liberty authorised through the LPS regime. And as I mentioned earlier, this means that there are no statutory timeframes for regular reviews and that after the initial 12 month renewal period, the authorisation could be renewed for three years. And I might be getting the wrong end of the stick on all of this, of course, but I'm worried about that. I'm worried about what that might mean for people with learning disability, particularly in response to some of the social media campaigns by parents of people with learning disabilities or autism who've spent long periods of time in inpatient units um, and, and not really receiving any treatment. Um, there are consultations going on currently about the Mental Health Act white paper. There will be one on the code of practice when it emerges from the Department of Health and Social Care. Uh, and it's important, I think, that people respond to them. If these frameworks intersect with your life in any way, consultations are there for people to be able to present their views to government. They may or may not listen, but if you don't present their views, um, there's no way of them listening. Secondly, um, and perhaps more substantively, the capabilities approach invites us to consider what role deprivations of and restrictions on individual liberty play in ensuring that disabled people have the support and resources they require in order to do the things they value and to live the life they wish. Most often, a care plan that includes deprivation of liberty includes these kinds of restrictions to safeguard the disabled person from significant harm. In many cases, the harm that the person would be at risk of if they were not subject to constant supervision and control would be bodily injury, perhaps as a result of low awareness of the dangers of traffic or because they would be unable to secure nourishment for themselves. And deprivation of liberty cases under the Mental Capacity Act in the Court of Protection have, I think, um, covered a very wide range of potential harms to the person. Reported case law on deprivation of liberty has also covered situations including those where the person who would be deprived of their liberty um, goes a bit beyond that. So uh, there was the RB case about potential harms from alcohol and substance abuse, um, or there was a case recently about um, protecting uh, a young man from uh, engaging in autoerotic asphyxiation. And um, there have been cases about using deprivation of liberty safeguards to protect um, people with learning disabilities and autism from sexual abuse, or to protect them from the harms associated with committing sexual offences against other people and therefore being at risk of criminal prosecution. These are complicated cases, but we don't really talk about them outside of court of protection practice, if you like. Um, and I think it's important that these stories end up in the media as well and get talked about as, as reasons why we need to have these checks and balances because being prosecuted for something is going to be a much greater deprivation of your liberty than a care plan that says you should be supervised when you're out and about. Um, for the avoidance of doubt, I'm really not arguing that we shouldn't intervene to protect disabled people from harm. 
rather, I think that the capabilities approach helps us to see that the concept of deprivation of liberty as it's developed in the jurisprudence since the Bornwood case has become much broader than it was then. Um, and if we look at the dolls and the LPS from the perspective of how they enable disabled people who are subject to authorizations under that framework to do the things they value or live the life they desire, then that might help to reground these frameworks as fundamentally about protecting freedom rather than about authorizing restrictions on that freedom. And the change in name from deprivation of liberty safeguards to liberty protection safeguards is one element of this shift in focus. But changing the name won't be enough if in practice the function of the LPS is still merely to authorise restrictions in a more cost effective way than under the dolls. Um, so I think it's important that we just think about this. We, we talk about why the liberty protection safeguards are safeguards and they're about freedom. And they're not about deprivation of liberty. They're not about locking people up. They're about enabling people to live the life they want to live and do the things they want to do. I think the creeping expansion of the legal framework associated with the deprivation of liberty um, can create challenges for um, its image, if you like, um, especially when it overlaps with disabled people's rights to private and family life and their rights to live independently and be included in the community. And one of the drivers of this tension is the complex relationship with lawful deprivation of liberty and the need for resources to be allocated to enable disabled people to live independently with support. Um, the LPS will sit, as the dolls do now, within a wider policy context around disability rights, care and support. Policy frameworks surrounding learning disabilities and autism have focused on deinstitutionalisation for a long time now, 30, 40 years. Um, for some disabled people, that means living independently in the community, in their own home, with support from paid care staff. For many others, it involves living with family carers. And some of the most challenging disputes around deprivation of liberty have come up in the context of disabled adults living at home with their parents who provide care and support either instead of or alongside paid carers. And I said I'd come back to the AEL case, that recent one. Um, I'm only talking about it because it's recent. Um, AEL was described in that case um, as a 31 year old woman who lives with her parents in their family home. She has a rare chromosomal condition leading to a number of physical and mental disabilities. She has severe learning disability, significant visual impairment and profound deafness. She suffers from asthma, eczema and severe allergies. She's non-verbal and can only walk short distances. She does not have a regular sleep pattern. At times, she may behave in a way which causes herself injury. There was no plan to change AEL's living situation, but whether or not this amounted to a deprivation of liberty was the subject of a lengthy disagreement between AEL's father and the local authority responsible for supporting her care. AEL's father vehemently disputed, it would seem, that the arrangements for her care amounted to a deprivation of her liberty. The local authority was clear that in law they do, because they do. Um, from the history provided in the judgment, it seemed like there was a bit of fudging that went on for a while to try and damp down this dispute, which was unsuccessful in the end. The, the most recent order is made in much clearer terms. Um, so AEL is de deprived of her liberty. It's she's subjected to continuous supervision and control and um, she doesn't have the capacity to consent and she's not free to go and live somewhere else. Uh, it's no surprise that the uh, verdict there was that AEL's current care arrangements amount to a deprivation of her liberty, because under the law, they do. When the LPS come into force, AEL's care arrangements will be of a kind suitable for authorisation through that new framework, uh, which should be less burdensome for all involved. But given how doctrinally unsurprising AEL's case is, I think it's ideal for looking at from a different perspective. In uh, The Idea of Justice, um, one of his more recent books, Marcia Sen, explores a response to his capabilities approach from Philip Pettit that argues that capabilities that are favour dependent do not count as real freedoms. Pettit's argument is that if a person can choose between option A or option B, but whether or not they're able to enjoy that choice is dependent on the favour of others to enable it, then that person does not have the real freedom to choose. Um, and I think this is kind of what's going on with the liberty protection safeguards and deprivation of liberty um, as we regulate it in England and Wales. Um, Pettit described this as a Republican approach to liberty in that it requires not just the absence of interference, but also the absence of a power of arbitrary interference on the part of others, the absence of any domination. Um, 
AEL's case is an example of this. She is given lots of choices about what she would like to do, but whether her choice then leads to the realisation of that desire depends on whether her family carers or paid carers are available to support that activity and whether they authorise that activity. AEL does not, therefore, have what Pettit would understand as real freedom. Sen disagrees. Sen argues for a more pluralistic understanding of freedom. He argues um, that we should focus on the outcome, not the process. We should focus on um, whether or not the person with a disability has the ability to live the life they want to live. He offers three examples. So uh, person one is not helped, uh, a person like AEL, let's say, not helped by others, and so she's unable to go out of her house. Case two, uh, the person is always helped by others, arranged either by a social security system or through goodwill, and she's a result fully able to go out of her house whenever she wants and to move around freely. Uh, um, person three has well-remunerated servants who obey and have to obey her commands, and she's fully able to go out of her house whenever she wants and move around freely. Sen argues that his capability as approach to freedom would see case two and three as essentially the same, whereas Pettit's Republican approach would only understand case three as real freedom, because the disabled person is not reliant on the goodwill of others. And the central issue for the capabilities approach is whether the person has the capability to do the things in question, not necessarily how that capability comes about. Um, but if we only understand case three in Sen's examples as being giving freedom to the disabled person, then the vital contributions of unpaid care and social security and social support um, are kind of hidden. Um, and my point in bringing this example in is to kind of think through how that might help us to view the protection of liberty under Article 5 from a different angle to the way that it's become sedimented through the Dole's and the Cheshire West case and the jurisprudence of the Court of Protection and the LPS. I do have some sympathy for those family carers who see the dolls process as an unnecessary, expensive and time consuming distraction from the business of caring. Um, for people who um, spend their lives fighting to get care, fighting for every little bit of support that they get for their um, family member, it's not surprising that they think that this bureaucratic framework that costs lots of money is something that's unnecessary and that the, the resources that are used on that bureaucratic framework should perhaps be used on care and support. Um, and the, the father in AEL's case is not alone. Uh, evidence to the um, Joint Committee on Human Rights when they were looking at this law it seemed to um, seemed to come up with a number of different family members who were feeling similar kinds of things. Um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a challenge there, I think. Um, there's one other challenge that I haven't really spoken about that I'm going to skip over, um, but that's that the European Court of Human Rights have never actually said that um, deprivation of liberty in the community is covered by Article 5.1e of the Convention. Instead, they've limited the relevance of Article 5.1e to deprivations of liberty that take place in institutional settings, hospital, clinic or other appropriate institution is how they've defined it. So there is a tension in the law there as well that I think um, we need to talk about. Anyway, um, fundamentally, I think that the LPS um, provides an administratively workable solution it will enable regular checks to be made on care arrangements for people in all kinds of care settings. Um, and I think if your interest is in due process and the theory of rights, the dolls, the LPS, they're an important safeguard against arbitrary interference with disabled people's rights to liberty and security of the person. But family carers and disabled people, people who often have to struggle and fight for every little bit of support they receive, may view the bureaucratic machinery of the dolls and the LPS as representing a huge waste of public funds. And looking at the issue through the lens provided by the capabilities approach helps us, I think, to bring both of these perspectives into view. And I'm going to wrap up now. Um, in this lecture, I've tried to do three things. I've given you a potted history of where we got to with the liberty protection safeguards and why reform was needed. Second, I explored that reform in quite a proceduralist way, drawing on the practical concepts set out by Lord Bingham in his analysis of the rule of law. I then turned to explore these issues through the capabilities approach, and I had to rush because I checked the time. Um, and my analysis of the LPS through these three lenses um, leads me to consider that, yes, the LPS has the potential to be a good law, 
um, subject to a few caveats. I think that we need to talk about it. It's a very lawyerly solution with lots of procedural safeguards. But the issues that came to the fore during the passage of these reforms in Parliament suggest that more needs to be done to align our lawyerly ways of thinking about procedural matters with the ways that disabled people, family carers and frontline professionals understand disability justice. The emphasis on public reasoning and debate provided by the capabilities approach might enable us all, especially those of us prone to proceduralist lawyerly responses to the challenges of inequality and injustice, to think differently about disability rights. Disability human rights and disability social justice tell us that the future for disabled people needs to hinge around living and being part of our communities with support as they need and as is required by them. We need to plan for this with frameworks that reflect the reality of disabled people's lives and that are responsive to changing public understandings of disability equality and disability justice. I think this is essential after the disproportionate impact that this pandemic has had on disabled people as well. How do we do this? Well, I think we do this through public engagement and debate. There are consultations live at the moment that we should respond to. Um, anyone who has a stake in them should respond to these consultations. And those of us with the resources to understand complex legal issues should spend some of our time at least supporting others who have less, less access to that set of skills to do so as well. Public engagement and debate should, I would hope, lead to more careful implementation of reforms and proposals for reform and to more ongoing scrutiny. Um, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Rosie. Thank you very much. My apologies. Thank you for coping with the technology so much better than I just did. Oh. And for such a comprehensive review of where we've been, where we hope to be going, and the prospects of us getting there safely. I don't think there was a washing machine moment there anywhere. Huh. Um, and, and I personally found it encouraging in the slightly dark days of pandemic to hear such a positive and optimistic assessment. But as you said, there are a healthy number of questions. OK, right. There were two practical questions, which we'll start with first, if we can. The first one comes from Aidan Cooney, who says the LPS and assessment framework. I read these assessments will be done via Care Act assessment framework. Is this correct? I don't think so. Um, so the Care Act assessment framework is, is rather different. Um, there are particular types of assessments that need to be done for the LPS. Uh, I'm not... I don't have the uh, sort of logistics of it to hand, um, but I'm sure it will all become much, much clearer when the code of practice is published, um, because that will tell people what will happen and in what order and when. But Care Act assessments are different. They're assessments for um, support needs or care needs. Uh, so care and support needs for people who need care and support or uh, needs assessments for carers. And they're, they're a separate thing. It's a separate okay, and for following on from that, Sam, says that um, Sam is really interested in your views on the use of remote assessments. For example, should we consider how often remote assessments are relied on without seeing the person face to face at least some stage by the social worker or AMCP? The, the pandemic suggests has certainly shifted how we currently operate. Yeah, I think face to face assessments are really, really important. I think we've got to remember that this kind of technology can be alienating to people. And it also stops you from being able to see the peripheral things that go on in people's lives. Um, and I've been doing a lot of work over the last little while with um, family carers and people with learning disabilities. There's a project called the Clarity Project, which you can see some of the information about on my uh, legalcapacity.org.uk website. Um, and they have told me about experiences of um, finding that assessments aren't really happening in the ways that they would like or feeling that things are being left out as a result of remote assessments. So I think when we can, it would be good sometimes, must, much of the time, to go back to face-to-face -to -face assessments as much as possible. Um, but these tools are good tools and, you know, they can be ways to drop in or check in without the additional expense, perhaps, of travel. Thank you. Uh, and another one from, uh, one from Kieran Scully, who says, whose responsibility would it be to make a court of protection application for de deprivation of liberty? Typically, especially if it's in the care plan, would it be with social services or with care providers? Uh, at the moment, it would, dolls, it would be social services. 
And here's an interesting one from Alex Ruck Keen, who oh, absolutely who who asks um, your view as to whether Mig and Meg are deprived of their liberty for the purposes of the CRPD, or, or indeed Stephen Neary back home. Uh, and if they are, how do we resolve the conundrum? I think they might not be, Alex. Um, Certainly, I don't think that the European Court of Human Rights would say that they're being deprived, particularly Stephen Neary at home, is being deprived of his liberty. Um, Mig and Meg, mm, mm, it's a state placement, so it's somewhat different, perhaps. Um, is it, res and you're asking for the purposes of the CRPD, if they're yeah. being deprived of their liberty on the basis of being disabled, then no, the committee would be most um, unpleased by that. Uh, maybe maybe the way, the way we resolve the conundrum is to support them to make an individual petition to the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and see what they say. I think that might be taken as a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bev Clough um, says that, thank you very much, that was really interesting, Rich, lots to think about. She's particularly finding the capabilities approach and shifting the lens potentially yeah. fruitful and she asks do you anticipate any resistance to this at a theoretical level, particularly given critiques that Nussbaum in particular doesn't deal well with disability? And are you thinking that republicanism in tandem with capabilities is useful or are you less sympathetic towards republicanism here? Okay, uh, I'm not, not there. there are lots of questions from Bev, thanks Bev. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Republicanism, I'm not hugely sympathetic to, generally, because it tends to obscure, as Sen says, the, the importance of social support and social systems and social welfare. So I'm not terribly keen on that and less sympathetic towards that. Nussbaum has been criticised for not dealing well with disability, but just because a conceptual thinker or a theorist or someone who has said interesting things doesn't then take the cognitive leap to somewhere that you're interested in doesn't mean that you should dismiss everything that they've said so um i have had resistance when talking about capabilities uh, in disability studies audiences at times and um, because nussbaum doesn't deal well with disability and particularly with intellectual disability um in her work but i think we can just go well that's fine she thinks that i think something different actually uh, and, and move on. So I, I know you use the capabilities approach as well, and I think we can continue to use capabilities approach to, uh, to help us to answer some of these difficult questions. And actually the thing in this area that I think is most important about capabilities is public discussion. We need to stop pretending that people with disabilities are not part of wider society. They are. They're our neighbours <laughs> and family members and the people that we live around. Coming back to a more um, black letter law kind of question, Rhonda Starling asks, will there be a role for RPRs in LPS as in dolls? Um, the uh, relevant person's representative will be called the appropriate person and it will not be a paid role ever in the LPS. Is my and, understanding. and Claire Webster asks, do you think if the Mental Health Act reform removes autism and learning disability from its scope, that that will affect the scope of the LPS or will it create another gap? I, my fear is that the LPS will expand like a big balloon um, to take those people into its, into its ambit and, and that it would then stop those people with learning disabilities and autism who are um, in inpatient treatment places um, like St Andrews or whatever wherever um, from having access to the mental health tribunal system and, and the particular safeguards that there are in the Mental Health Act which don't exist in the Mental Capacity Act. That's my fear. I have no evidence for that fear being a reality. That's your crystal ball and there's another question uh, which um, uh, asks you to look into your crystal ball from Alex Cisneros who thanks you very much for your interesting talk and says, is there anything in the LPS, LPS scheme that you think will immediately need clarification through litigation if and when it comes into force? Or, or is there a hope that the code will fill the current gaps? Um, I hope that the code will fill the current gaps. Um, 
I was very, very worried about the care home manager's provisions um, and the potential for a conflict of interest between a person who needs to fill beds in their care home and uh, that person being heavily responsible for authorising a deprivation of liberty in that care home. Uh, I think that would have had to have been tested in the courts quite quickly. Um, it depends what the Code of Practice says in many respects in relation to the definition, I think. Um, well, nobody knows yet what that's going to say. So two, two particular greetings to you from Elaine Hochley and Henna Nikumar from Finland, but just one final question. Uh, if we can um, bear with us, please, Rosie. One well, final question from Magdalena Fogalska. How could appropriate persons be supported to understand the new regime and carry out their duties? Now, Magda's one of my PhD students and she's been working with me on the Clarity Project. So I think she's allowing me to do a little plug of my obsession with accessible legal information. We're not very good at making complicated legal topics accessible to people but this particular system the LPS where appropriate persons are always unpaid we need to make it accessible we need to figure out how to take these really complicated legal concepts and turn them into something that makes sense to anybody and everybody and we do that by using plain language and we do it by using easy read um, publications so pictures and language and using all of the skills that are out there in the disability communities to enable us to help enable disabled people and the people who work with and support and live with and love and care disabled people to take control of that process. Thank you and I'd like to give you one more opportunity for a plug because right at the outset there was a couple of expressions of interest in your everyday decisions project is there anywhere you'd like to point any of the delegates to? Yes, www.legalcapacity.org.uk. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for what's been an arduous hour for you, but a pleasure for the rest of us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to UCL and thank you to all of the delegates for attending. I hope you all have a very um, thoughtful rest of the evening. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>